Okay, my wonderful students, let's get read, let's get going with lecture. This is our last lecture of the week. This quote from Winston Churchill is kind of a famous one from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. He said that in, in the late 1940s, and that's where the term iron curtain comes from, which we refer to as the, you know, the boundary of the Soviet empire and stuff like that. Anyway, springs in oscillation today. And actually, we're not going to get out of chapter 16.1, but uh, which is, I was hoping to, to start with chapter 16.2, but I was talking about springs and oscillations. Get your clicker ready. Um, here's a spring system. Uh, and we're going to talk about oscillation along the x-axis. So the spring has a ma the, the spring system has a mass and a spring. Now the spring uh, has what we call a spring constant. Now you guys have done springs in lab, correct? Yeah. All right. So you know about the spring constant. But you're not gonna you're you're gonna have some deluxe concepts today about springs. Uh, so the spring constant, okay, that's the stiffness factor. Now I looked up some some real springs at a uh, you know, a website that sells springs. So, for instance, an automotive spring, you know, that's in your suspension of your car, the spring uh, factor or the, the spring constant uh, is rated at uh, 500 pounds per inch. Now, that's in English, uh, pounds for force, inch for displacement. Uh, we're going to be uh, doing a, a calculation in a few minutes with the K uh, spring constant value in newtons per meter. Uh, but, you know, the, the other thing on that website, it had all kinds of different springs. Now, here's a tiny spring, you know, something like you might find in a watch or maybe in a cell phone, uh, something really small that's not going to move an inch. Uh, but if it did, it would have a 20 pounds per, per inch displacement. So that rates the stiffness factor uh, of the spring. Now, um, the restoring force, the idea of restoring force uh, is relative to the equilibrium position of the spring. Now, my diagram up here, uh, this top um, diagram of the spring mass system, I'm going to declare that the equilibrium state of the spring mass system. So when it's totally relaxed, you know, you hook it up and you just let it sit there. This is where it likes to sit. It's neither stretched nor compressed. It's just sitting there, okay? And when it's sitting there um, at position X0, all right, so that denotes my, at least for the next few slides, that denotes the equilibrium position on the x-axis. And it could be a negative number or a positive number, but anyways, it's an equilibrium position. Um, if you're at that position, the spring exerts no force, neither a pull nor a push. All right, now let's do another sketch. And this time we're going to compress it a little bit. So go ahead and compress your uh, spring in there and sketch it in a, just a little bit to the left. All right. And so now if, if X is less than X0, in other words, if, you're, if X1 is to the left there, you know, the center of mass of the mass, center of that block, uh, then the force is to the right. Now, you have to have some numbers and some distances in, you know, centimeters or meters and a spring constant in newtons per meter in order to tell how many newtons. But at least, you know, no matter what, if you're over there to the left, your force is going to be a positive number. The, you know, so you're going to have, you know, positive 17.3 newtons to the right, all right? And that's what that red arrow denotes. So no matter what else, that's what a restoring force does. Now, um, that's going to be a positive number of newtons um, and, you know, positive denoting rightward. Now, go ahead and sketch yourself in uh, with uh, extended, you know, the second one is compressed. All right. 
Now, I'm not saying it's at maximum compression. I'm not saying anything about it. I'm just saying it's somewhere to the, to the left. Now, the extended one, I'm not saying it's at maximum extension or anything else, but it is to the right somewhere. So X2 is a little bit greater than X0. And just for conversation purposes, it could, you know, X2 could be uh, X, whatever X0 is plus two centimeters, right? And if it is, it'll map out somewhere to the right. And guess what happens? The force is back to the left. Now here's the force. Um, and let me just park it above the block. All right, so there's the force up there. And it's, you know, no matter what size it is, definitely it's going to be the left. Now, we haven't dealt with this, the magnitude of the force, but we're going to do that. But I want you to uh, make a note here. You know, we talked about stability. Remember the pencil that we talked about up on its, uh, on its end? And if you tilted it a few degrees to the left, it would want to come swing back to the right. But if you, if you, if you tilted it a little too far over, it would fall to the left. Okay, and so that's what we got here. Uh, and the spring is always a restoring force. The pencil is not. The pencil within a, a, a few degrees of left or right, it will restore itself to equilibrium. This one will always do it, unless you break it or something. You know, I guess springs could be broken. Now, the magnitude of the force is proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. All right, so... The spring constant is the constant of proportionality. And X is the symbol for your displacement away from equilibrium. Now, it's nice to uh, set your uh, X axis so that the equilibrium position is at X equals zero. But you don't have to. You know, you, you know if, you're, if you have a hanging oscillator, you know, it's more natural to uh, declare the, the top of the oscillator, you know, where you attach the spring to be zero, and then, you know, your equilibrium point is going to be some negative number. And then it's going to oscillate to a less negative and then down to a more negative, and then up to a less negative, down to a more negative, okay? Now, so that's the magnitude of the force. Now, combining the directionality of part two, the restoring force nature of it, and the magnitude in part three, this is your formula, F equals minus KX. The minus sign encodes the fact that whatever X is, the force is the opposite. So if X is positive, the minus sign means the force is going to be negatory to the left. That's the third one here. Then the middle one, if X is negatory, then the force is going to be positive to the right. So that's the middle case. And then, of course, zero. you, get, you don't get zip-zap. Uh, if x is equal to zero. All right. Now let me pause for questions. Yes. Repeat. No, x is not equal to ma. Minus kx is equal to ma. Okay. Remember when we did that a couple of weeks ago? We we did centripetal force and gravitation, and we said mv squared over r equals g m1 m2 over r squared. And we got the, you know, then we talked about geosynchronous set. Here's another case, different force, uh, put in f equals ma, and, you know, you know, ma equals minus kx. And whenever you have that, you have an oscillator. So my, my first uh, point to you here, uh, the, the uh, important um, Point is, if you, if you have a system in which the force is a restoring force proportional to displacement, you know, so X coordinate, Y coordinate could be an angular coordinate, theta, you know, like in spherical coordinates. If you have anything like that times the square of a coordinate, that coordinate is going to oscillate for whatever object you're describing, in this case, this block. Question. It is kind of, for this diagram, yeah. X would be um, uh, x minus x naught, x minus x zero. But if we put um, equilibrium at x equals zero, then it's just x. Okay. 
Okay, so so you have to be uh, agile, mentally agile, to, to understand that question. Yeah, x is like a vector, and we're using positive and negative to encode the uh, directionality of it. It's one-dimensional, so that's fine to use it that way. But yeah, it should be a vector. And there's ways to do uh, what we call an isotropic oscillator, where you have um, angular motion and you have oscillation. Your your force is basically minus k times r, di the distance away from the center of the coordinates. Uh, so you can have all kinds of oscillations. Now, let's do a simple calculation for some auto springs using f equals minus kx. Get your calculator out. And uh, two of you have already clicked in an answer, even though I haven't given you the question yet. So let me let me stop this and start anew. So all right, so write down f equals minus kx. Uh, and here's your question. It's actually f equals minus ky in this case, but. All right, so there's your there's your task. Where where is y? You know this thing. You know you put a, put a load, a metric ton on this thing. It's going to press the spring downward. So here, Rachel, y equals zero is equilibrium. Okay, so we're just going to say that. And you're free to say that. You can you know say it's any number you want. Just, you know move your axes up and down, but Zero is usually pretty simple. So we're going to get a negative number here. What is the negative number? Now you got four options. But only one of them is correct. Or as they say in the Highlander, in the end there can only be one. That's right. I chopped that chop up. Yeah, but that Highlander, that's that's science fiction actually. So Yeah, I wouldn't say that if Sean Connery was in the room, he might chop my head off, but he was the best part of that movie. <laughs> yeah. Spanish guy with a Scottish accent, yeah. But you know there's there's uh up in Ireland they have what they call the black Irish. And they think that those are people that emigrated to Ireland from Spain, I guess. I'm not sure if that's true, but that's what I heard, black Irish. Okay, 30 seconds to finish. This should be extremely easy. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One. Zero. Okay, I guess you guys are done. Um, yeah, let's check this out. So here's your formula. Here's your net force formula. Okay, and it's equal to zero because the, the springs are going to come to rest, you know, down at, you know, y equals negative point oh something. All right, so we, we use the equilibrium equation there. Mg equals minus ky. And you got to have your minus signs uh, pro proper here. Okay, so here's your fill in, uh, fill in the uh, plugins, uh, 1,000 kilograms for the mass. And you usually we ignore the mass of the spring. Uh, negative 9.8 meters per second squared for, for G. And then minus K, Y. So minus K is negative 1.30 times 10 to the 5 newtons per meter. Okay, and so that's a normal size for a car spring. You know, before I had 500 pounds per inch. So this is something normal for uh, 
a car spring in the metric system. And then my unknown y. Now that's equal to zero. So um, if you uh, push the uh, mg over to the other side, you get 9,800 over there. Then divide uh, both sides by negative 1.30 times 10 to the 5 newtons per meter. You get negative uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.0754. All right, so that's B. So the correct answer on that one is B. Raise your hand if you got that, if you, if you answer. Okay, good. All right, now. You ready? Uh, this is what I consider a very, very basic equation. Now, we've had three midterms, so all, all the testing ahead of us is the final. You might see something a little bit like this on the final in multiple choice. I can't tell you what's on the final because I haven't written it, but I'm just saying it. All right, let's keep going. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at this. And what we're going to do here is talk about cycles and uh, oscillations. All right. And again, we're going to use the same picture of an oscillator. And here we're going to set the uh, equilibrium to, to x equals 0, 0.0, so it's nice and easy. Uh, question. Yeah. That's right, because the other side of the equation, I had the two, the two constituent forces, the weight force downward and the spring force, which is pulling up, they balance. So the sum of those two vectors equals zero. That's, you know, so they balance. Um, okay, now position uh, in an os oscillatory system is what we call a sinusoidal function of time. It involves the sine function, and I'll show it to you in a second. So if this is um, maximum x, now I'm putting in a maximum x. You know, it's going to oscillate from, from maximum extension at x max to maximum compression at minus x max. Now, usually springs are pretty close to symmetric. But if they get worn out or something like that over time, x max and minus x max might not be the same number. I mean, you can't use them. But this we're assuming it's symmetric. Okay, so there's my – those are the boundaries of my oscillation. All right. The function of time for the x component or the x coordinate is whatever x max is times the sine of omega t. Now, omega is um, the what we call the angular frequency. We don't call it angular velocity here. We use the same symbol, omega. But now it's an angular frequency because frequency times time is equal to a pure number. And a pure number has to be inside the parentheses uh, of a sine, cosine, or tangent function. Uh, so... This one graphs up as a sine curve, which you've seen in trig class. The velocity is the complementary function of time. So that would be the cosine. And what it looks like is this. V of t is V max times cosine of omega t. All right, same. They vary with the same angular frequency omega. The same time. We would say that's the same time dependence. But notice the constant in front of the cosine is a velocity. So that might be like, you know, 1.3 meters per second. And x max might be, you know, um, uh, 0 0.72 meters. In other words, 72 centimeters. All right. So whatever they are, those two uh, dimensions are different. These are, two, these are apples and oranges. One is a position. One's a velocity. All right. And the, as I mentioned, the angular velocity symbol omega, it, we're now using it for angular frequency, all right? But actually, we still call it angular because all of these 
these pair of functions can be related to a circle. And we're going to do that in just a minute. Okay, because you know, um, sine and cosine, you know, sine of theta, cosine of theta are the uh, x and y coordinates of a point on a circle. Okay, and so we're going to make that correspondence here in a second. Now, uh, together these things map out, in general, they map out an ellipse. Under certain conditions, they might map out a perfect circle. And, you know, if you change the scale, of the x-axis or the momentum axis, you know, you can make any ellipse into a perfect circle. So uh, just calling it an ellipse in phase space is sufficient. Now, uh, that being the case, uh, we're going to uh, also use uh, the momentum as a function of time, which is just m times v of t. So m v max times cosine omega t, all right? So those are the sinusoidal functions of time and you know these are not the only ones um, you could use um, this is uh, let's see the sine of zero is uh, what's the sine of zero sine of zero is zero cosine of zero is one so this thing starts at zero on the x-axis and v max uh, on the and 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 p max uh, on the momentum axis, so it's going to be way up on the momentum axis at time t equals zero. But you, you know, if it starts, if if you if you pull the spring out to maximum extension out here to the right and start from rest and release it, then v v is equal to zero out there. And x is equal to x max out there. So you could, and that would be a different, you know, you would use sines and cosines a little differently. Uh, but this is a good typical uh, set of uh, sines and cosines. All right, now let's take a trip back down memory lane to geometry class or maybe uh, trig uh, and analytic geometry from high school. You may remember um, some of the features of a circle. So if you take a radii and draw it in at some tilt angle theta above the x-axis. Now this is this is graph paper now. This is xy graph paper. We're going to relate it to um, a, a graph uh, that is abstract that you can't use. You can't visualize it other than your graph. But this is like xy graph paper. Okay. And the x, y coordinates up here, hopefully this makes sense to you. Um, the x coordinate is r cosine theta. And the y coordinate is r times the sine of theta. You know, so whatever the radius is, capital R, you know, those, those will. So if you let theta go from 0 to 2 pi and put a dot for every, you know, every 0.1 radians, you'll have a bunch of dots. You have basically 62 dots uh, around this circle, and it'll map out to a full circle. Okay, so now, that's geometry. Right? So my, my idea here is um, if theta is equal to omega t, then you could also give it some time dependence. So that means that if this thing is spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, now here's where we get back to this, the, the idea of spin and rotation. If we say that theta is time dependent, omega t, um, that means it's spinning at a constant angular velocity. So this thing's just going, you know, la, 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 going around in a circle, happy as a clam. You know, at you know angular uh, velocity omega, right? So this this thing is uh, is what I want you to um, make sure you have that in mind. Now that's looking a little bit like what we had before, right? Now let's go to physics. That's geometry class. This is physics. Here's phase space.
phase space is momentum on the vertical axis and the corresponding. So this is the X component of the momentum. It's the only momentum on, on our system you know, because we're restricting it to X. So X and P is, is sufficient. Here's theta. Now, X comma MV in phase space is going to be X down here at the bottom, X max times cosine omega T. And P max times sine omega T. Now, this is a little bit different from the one we used a few minutes ago. We had sine and cosine, but this is still fine. This one starts, let's see, uh, cosine of zero is one. So this one, this configuration starts, let me get my cursor. This one starts right here. It starts at X max, sine of zero is zero. So it starts with, you know, P max times zero, that's zero. So it doesn't start with any momentum. So this is like starting an object, pulling it out to the X, Maximum extension and letting it go. All right. And then this is the uh, equation of motion uh, for the X and the momentum. Now, this is what we call a phase portrait or a phase chart. All right. Write that down. This is phase space. I'm, I'm willing to bet that you didn't talk about this in the least up there in the labs, but we're talking about it now. All right, so this is kind of boring, ellipses, circles, nice, very good, cosine and cosine of omega t, blah, 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 blah. Now, let me show you another application uh, of phase space. This one is medical. This is the phase portrait or phase space reconstruction of a patient's EKG trace. But now you've, you're using the EKG trace and you're using its complementary phase on the vertical axis. And this is, a, this is what we call a phase space representation of a patient's, this is 10 beats. I pulled this out of an article. Here's the article, you know, from 2015, International Journal of Cardiology. This is a normal patient. This is 10 beats of a normal patient's heart in sinus rhythm. Okay, sinus rhythm means ba-boom, 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 ba-boom at regular intervals. Very precise, very regular. And you can see that this, this thing loops around in phase space and it's got a little bit of a jig down here, you know, cause that's like, that's because a, a, an EKG, it's not, an EKG is not a perfect up and down wave. You know, it's not a perfect sine function. Okay. If it were, we'd get an, a perfect ellipse. So it's got spikes in it and it's got downward spikes in it. And that's this jazz over here, right? But basically, it makes one loop around this thing and kind of does a little semi-loop down here and a blip down here and back around. And this is 10 of them traced out on uh, this, this phase space diagram. All right? And here's the actual article. Prompt and accurate diagnosis of ventricular arrhythmias with a novel index based on phase space reconstruction of ECG electrocardiogram. And they're the authors, uh, you know, I think they're up in Cambridge in England. So now you may think to yourself, Dr. B, so what? Ventricular whatification. Yeah, so ventricular tachycardia, VT, uh, that's death. That's almost instantaneous death, sudden death. You know, you go into ventricular tachycardia, you got seconds to get out of it. Same thing over here, ventricular fibrillation, you're in a world of hurt. You know, your, your death is seconds away. Unless somebody can diagnose it and zap you back into a sinus rhythm. 
So when they, you know what they do in you know, a case like that, that's like on TV shows, you know, where they're in the hospital and they take the guy's shirt off and they put a little grease on there and then they get the paddles and then, you know, and they grease up the paddles and then they, you know, put the, and then they say, clear! And then they pound the guy in the chest with the two paddles and the guy goes like, like that. And all of a sudden he's, you know, he's back to normal, you know. But apparently that hurts like hell when they do it. That's what I've heard. Has anybody ever had that in the ER? I, God bless you, I hope not. But if you if you ever if you ever have to get uh, converted like that by by the Zet, it's basically a huge bunch of voltage, not a whole lot of current, but a big voltage. And by the way, shh, okay, everybody's excited about getting zapped. The the this previous slide. Let me go back. This one, those are actually voltages on both axes. They label it as X, but I think it's it's uh, voltages from the EK from the ECG electrocardiogram. So here's so here's the article, and you can look it up. Um, and here's the two symbols of death. So you definitely want to know about this stuff. Now here's. Here's figure two from, you know, the first one was figure one. This is figure two. And down here, so up here is the uh, sinus rhythm. And you can see, you know, it's got some loop the loops uh, because the, the heart doesn't have a perfect, you know, the heart's not like a pendulum. A pendulum would have a perfect back and forth ellipse. But the heart's not exactly, but, it's, it, but you can see it, it's, it's trying to be as regular. And this is considered a healthy heart up here. And down here, look at this. This is trouble. And hopefully visually, that convinces you that ventricular, uh, t let's see, which one is, uh, C is ventricular tachycardia and D is ventricular fibrillation. And that thing's all over the place. Look at that. And, you know, the thing is, those things are actually kind of elliptical, but they're tilted. They're not flat. They're not oriented like this. They're kind of tilted, you know, like this, All right? So, you know, this whole idea of oscillating systems, you know, the heart is an oscillating system, and by God, we want to know the, the face space portrait of that thing because we can diagnose uh, ventricular fibrillation and other dangerous conditions by looking at that and hopefully acting fast enough to save the patient's life, which is what you want to do. So we're, you know, so the, the fact that you guys are learning about springs, and this is something I put in my annotations in, I think in actually in the introduction, 16.0, the introduction, that the, the, this humble spring mass system is easy to study. We have a fairly good handle on it. It's easy to experiment with. But some of the things that you learn in that study can be applied to saving a person's life and other cool stuff. Like, you know, this idea of phase space and oscillation, we apply that to the Big Bang Theory, the theory of the early universe the origin of the universe. And we apply it to oscillating systems like photons and electrons and, and subnuclear particles. Okay, so it's everywhere. And it's, it's, it's amazing that the stuff that you can learn, the basic stuff, you can then think, all right, you know, is this, an, you know, am I, you're, you're, you become a cardiologist and you're looking at, you know, these phase portraits for the first time and you're thinking to myself, now, what did Dr. B say about the, the energy, the total energy? What was he saying about the angular frequency? What did he say about the area? Oh, yeah. The area of that ellipse, big time important. Let's keep going. Now, this is, let me use this thing. So, oh, oh, I'm a little bit blooped up there. Um, my animation is blooped up. So this is a quote. F is the restoring force, 
X is the displacement from equilibrium or def deformation. And K is the, so deformation is like if you if you have a um, you know if your grandma or your mom they, they, you know make green jello with you know the little fruit cocktail in there and stuff like that you know and and you get a big blob of it on a plate and you you flick the you know you hit the plate a little bit the whole thing will start to oscillate all right so that's deformation oscillation. Anyway, so deformation of jello. K is the constant related to the difficulty in deforming the system. The minus sign indicates the restoring force is in the direction opposite to the displacement. So that's a nice little blurb from uh, chapter 16.1. Now, let me recall to you this uh, formula, the total mechanical energy. Now, we're not doing gravitational GPE. We're doing elastic spring potential energy so epe elastic potential energy plus good old ke the thing's oscillating you know that mass has got mass and it's got v so it's you know and the speed is changing so the kinetic energy is changing just like when we drop a basketball you know speed's increasing all the way down now for an oscillating mass the speed increases and then maxes out then it decreases back to zero and then it goes the other way. It goes to the left. It goes to maximum velocity to the left. And then it comes to a stop and starts going back to the right. And so and it just keeps cycling. Now, oh boy, this is, all right. So here's the um, electrical potential energy, or excuse me, that's what I, that's what I usually say EPE. Uh, elastic potential energy. This is the formula for it, 1 half kA squared. Uh, for those of you that have had calculus, you see anything interesting about this? It's an integral. It's a it's an integral. So minus minus the force times uh, dx. So so this is one half kx squared. All right, and it's pretty important. So let's let's keep let's keep zapping through here. So there it is. Now, um, let's plug that in to the total mechanical energy formula, all right? And here's what you got then. So you have 1 half kx squared, and then good old 1 half mv squared. Okay, nothing new about that. We've had that for a while. All right? Now, let me ask you if you noticed anything about that. Look at it carefully. Think like a mathematician. Think like a scientist. Think. Look at that equation. Ding, 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 ding. X squared plus Y squared equals 1 is the equation of an ellipse. In, you know, geometry class, XY graph paper. Now, this ain't XY graph paper. And what the, the graph that we want to use is phase space. Now, this is halfway to phase space because we got the X coordinate in there. All right. Now, we don't have P in there yet. Can you see? Can you see that there's, a, there's actually a P in there, a P squared? Yeah, there's one in there because there's a V squared. So all we have to do is, to, you know, multiply both sides of the, of the one, uh, the second term by M over M. Here's what we have. E is equal to x squared divided by 2 over k. Now there's the, so that's putting the 1 half k uh, out from out in front, and we're putting it down in the denominator. And then p squared over 2m, that's in the denominator, 2m. Now here's the interesting thing about this. You know, we've got this, and it's almost into the form we need for geometry class. I mean, so this is this is highly righteous right here. This is the thing that we want to think about. All right. Now look at those denominators. The denominator of the first term on the right has got a K in it. It's in the denominator of the denominator. All right. So the strength of the spring is encoded there. 
The second term on the right with P squared in the numerator, that's got the mass encoded. Right? It doesn't have any Ks in there, but it does have the mass. And oh, by the way, guess what omega is equal to? Omega is equal to a, a, a ratio of K and M. And I'll tell you about that on Monday. Or you could read about it. Now let's take a look at... So here's, so here's that last formula. And here's phase space. I've got a circle. X of T and P of T. Nice. And you know, in geometry class, here's the, here's the way that you map out an ellipse. One, or this is one of the ways. One equals X squared over A squared. And A squared is half the horizontal distance, or half the horizontal size. Y plus Y squared over B squared. And B is half the vertical size. So here are A and B. Okay, these two blue line segments. Okay, now that's in geometry class. Now we, we don't quite have that up here because we have a, a number. This could be 17 joules or something over here. But what we want is a dimensionless number that's equal to 1. So what we do is divide bo both sides by E. And what do we get? This. Now look. The total energy... It, capital E is in both denominators. And it's encoded with the spring constant here, in other words, the spring. And it's encoded over here with the, the inertia of the object. So this, and then this is exactly one over here. So, so there's, my, there's my correspondence. Now this thing is looking like... Um, an ellipse, just like we had in geometry class. Now, here's that. Here it is, in big, big letters. Now, my closing comment to you this afternoon is, an oscillator... Equation like this, it's an oscillator equation. This is the width, the square of the width. This is square of the height. And energy is tangled up with both of those. Now, go back to that electrocardiogram face portrait. How do you conceptualize E? How do you conceptualize the width of this thing? The height, the area, they all have a meaning. And I'll tell you what, for the, for the ECG here, for this phase reconstruction, I don't know what the answers are, but I bet those guys do that wrote that article. All right? So think about that over the weekend. I'll see you on Monday. You're dismissed, 420.